I met Freddie in the mid-80s. Um, I was working at the time for Dave Clark on a show called Time, which is um, um, a musical in the West End. Um, we were making the album, and Dave Clark thought two or three of the tracks on the album were ideal for Freddie. And um, as a logical continuation of the work I'd done on the album, um, Dave suggested the idea that Freddie and I might work together. Um, Freddie, I, I seem to remember at the time, I think was making the Mr. Bad Guy album in Munich. It certainly was resident in Munich. And um, we met at Abbey Road Studios for the first time. Um, and really that was the start of a, a long-term relationship. Um, we, we worked together from then on until, until, until Freddie died. It was um, a Queen album called The Game. And uh, I just had word, I uh, was working with Gary Moore at the time in Los Angeles and I had word uh, I w that I was supposed to come to Munich and uh, work on the album. So nobody seemed to know anything specific, so I figured I'd go hop on a plane, come to Munich and then I turned up in the studio and uh, a couple of minutes later Fred turned up and said, what? Um, introduced himself, I introduced myself and said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm supposed uh, to do this. And he said, no, uh, not that I know of, but uh, if you're here, great, let's start, let's get going. And uh, then we started doing a crazy little thing called love. The first time I worked with him, actually, um, was for A Kind of Magic. And uh, it was Roger's song. Uh, but Roger went away for two weeks to Los Angeles and Fred said, I want to have a look at this song of Roger's. I think it's got potential, but I don't like the way it is at the moment. I'm going to totally change it and rearrange it. <laughs> okay, fine. So we spent two weeks together in the studio and uh, it was the second day in, I think, and he was running up and down the studio full of ideas. And um, he said, I really want to do this now. Okay, great. But I had to change the tapes to, for him to be able to do this. Uh, and I made the mistake of not uh, doing running commentary of what I was doing. I just kept quiet and started changing tapes. And he was pacing up and down with this idea that he desperately wanted to get out. Um, and he turned to me, what on earth is going on? I'm waiting all this time. And I, hadn't, I should have said, look, I'm changing the tapes, I'm doing this and that. And uh, he got quite impatient with me for a moment because he was so fast, he would just wanted everything to happen as fast as it could. The first time I remember hearing Freddie Mercury, I was actually driving through, I, don't know, I was driving up Primrose Hill and Kenny Everett um, on Capital Radio then said, listen to this record, it's the best thing I've ever heard and it was Killer Queen. And it was an extraordinary record, it's still an extraordinary record. And I thought, well, this is, you know, the band of course had been around before then, but, but maybe not, um, maybe not so much in the public persona. Um, I just thought this was the most fantastic record and he was the most uh, amazing performer. And as the band became more and more visible in the media, um, I, I mean, not just me, but everybody b b began to be aware of what an extraordinary performer this chap was. Um, on every level, I mean, he was an incredible singer, absolutely amazing singer. I still struggle to find anybody that competes with Fred as a singer. And certainly, uh, as a rock and roll performer, I, I think anybody that's got a commanding stage presence has pinched something from Fred at one time or another. That goes from, you know, artists like Prince and you, you, you name it. They've all, in fact, in fact, they've admitted so much as well. Um, so, yeah, I was a big fan of, 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 um, of the group and Freddie, yes. From, from the first, first moment I became aware of them. All I knew was uh, stories and uh, video clips and uh, I was actually quite scared because uh, all you, uh, you just knew he was outrageous and uh, you expected, the, or I expected the worst. And uh, there he was and uh, as gentle and uh, helpful and just wonderful. He was extremely shy and uh, first meetings would always be to anybody terrible and uh, he would never be the first one to actually break the ice unless he really knew that he had to work with these people and uh, then he would just make a step forward and say right this is the way I want it and this is the way I do it. 
I don't think people at large realize um, how insecure people in Freddie's situation often are. Um, as we all do, Freddie had huge insecurities um, and even worried about his own ability. Now, that may surprise many people when you look at how confident and, and how wonderful a performer he was. Um, but he had those insecurities, as we all do. Um, he worried about his appearance, he worried about his voice, he worried about his writing. It didn't stop him from exploring all those things. Um, it didn't stop him from writing or performing, or it didn't stop him from, from appearing in public, so stating the obvious, really. But um, I don't think people realise to what extent he did worry about these things. He was a very gentle, sensitive man, really, um, in private life, definitely. I mean, not at all the flamboyant extrovert that we see on the videos and on the stage. Um, he would always remember people's birthdays, for instance. I mean, um, anyone around him, he knew their birthdays and there would be a present. He was so generous and um, very thoughtful. He was a very funny man, immensely entertaining, had a wicked sense of humour. Um, but there again, it was only one of those things you got when you knew him. Um, if you didn't know, if there were people around you didn't know, he was, a, he was actually a painfully shy man. When he relaxed with friends, he was immensely entertaining, very funny. Uh, Freddie was, I think, very much into being, uh, creating a mystique about him and not being too accessible by the media and uh, just being that outrageous guy which, who I was um, a little bit worried about to start with and uh, being at home uh, watching TV and uh, just m uh, making sure the Christmas tree is uh, decorated properly and uh, uh, having like a really nice household together. I think that uh, was the other person which uh, very few people knew. The short answer to did Freddie care about the press was yes, you care because they can be quite horribly vindictive and wounding and grossly inaccurate uh, and Freddie more than most suffered from people who really had the I don't know how to put this really well they just tell lies um, people that really had no business even talking about him if someone someone he didn't respect criticized his work he would go well you know what do they know the weakness probably was the insecurity he sort of had as any creative artist has uh, because you question yourself is this really good <laughs> is this just crap or uh, and uh, the nagging doubt that everybody around uh, who supports you sort of pat you on the back just to be on the payroll and says great man great man you're doing really good and uh, I think therefore we had a pretty good relationship because uh, I never bought into that kind of stuff. With regard to working with Montserrat, for example, he, he worried that people would misinterpret things, that m maybe imagine that he was trying to be something he wasn't, um, um, maybe worried that his voice wasn't good enough to, uh, on a par, to be on a par with her. Um, yeah, he, I mean... I, He'd a massive insecurities, as we all do, if we're really honest. Um, and I think, um, as often happens with people that are as, that are as highly profiled as, as Freddie, um, it's sometimes a surprise to people that, that they are normal human beings, and perhaps with many more insecurities and worries than, than most people. He worried about his friends um, and, and his family, and he was desperately keen to take care of everybody that he thought relied upon him. He was thinking about doing solo things for, uh, for the longest time, uh, possibly all the way through his career, but uh, I think it, he was m quite scared. He wanted to do uh, things like with, with Tina Turner, but uh, whenever it got close, uh, he always backed, backed out and probably felt he wasn't good enough or had 
just doubts about working in an environment outside uh, the, uh, the band. And uh, I'm not quite sure how this happened, but uh, maybe uh, simply because he was here in Munich, I was here, uh, and uh, I just said, let's get going. And uh, then he just jumped over his shadow and we started doing it. Working on a solo project, for instance, in Munich, um, I would pick him up by, uh, at around two at his apartment, take him to the studio, had breakfast, then uh, we probably played Scrabble or Trivial Pursuit. And uh, maybe around five o'clock, uh, we felt all bad enough and compelled to actually do something. So um, either that happened or we just had to wait till it was seven and uh, to go out for dinner. Uh, on other days, uh, we actually got a lot of work done in probably half the time it would have taken laboring over it <laughs> the day before. He was um, absolutely genius. I mean, I, I told him that many times, you're, you're a genius, and he said, no, nah, <laughs> I, <just do laughs> I just do it. And uh, really, it usually took him maybe 15, 20 minutes to come up with something absolutely brilliant. The actual execution of doing something, seeing it through to the end, that was a little harder for him. Because once he had the idea, uh, it was basically finished for him. But uh, always the strongest idea won. I mean, if it was really strong, then it was fought hard for. And the strongest idea would win, yes. But Fred was very much... Um, the director, I think, in some ways, especially when it came to the final touching up of songs and stuff. Mm -hmm. He had a, a fantastic um, knack, a, a fantastic ear for how a finished record should sound. And um, I learned a lot, <laughs> really a lot, from him for, through mixing with him, final records. Fred's description where, to the extent that uh, a heavy sound like a shopping mall dropping to the ground or mountains crumbling, sort of uh, fairly ex extreme comparisons to what he actually wanted. And sometimes it's pretty hard to keep up with all the ideas that keep coming out. I mean, especially from Freddie. I can remember one day we were working on uh, A Kind of Magic and he said, I want to hear a herd of wildebeests swinging from left to right. I said, oh yeah, fine, how am I going to do this? And I spent another two days thinking about it. Realising what he wanted, he wanted some kind of effect, stereo effects. And so eventually we came up with these magic effects that weren't swinging around. But he would, in one hour, come up with three days' work, really, in ideas. And then the job was to put it all down. There wasn't all that much of a concept in uh, I want to be different or do something outside. It's just he liked uh, danceable stuff very much and uh, black music, uh, danceable black music, and he just combined that and uh, did what he thought was right for him at the time. Fred's great joy was just being able to express himself um, without, without really having to worry about an audience or anything like that. Uh, or other people around. Um, so he'd launch himself into these um, absolutely fantastic flights of fancy sometimes. Um, and sometimes um, he would go out to sing a vocal, not really having written anything as a starting point. He would just go and sort of sing anything. And we'd pick it up and go, wow, that's, that's sort of okay. Let's, let's work on that bit. Freddie um, wrote most, most of the things in the studio. At times he was uh, toying with ideas, but uh, he tended to make things up on the spot. Or um, if it was extremely brilliant, uh, he made believe that he just made it up. But he worked it out before. Fred didn't want, really wanted uh, nobody else uh, around while he was singing, but uh, at the same time he was literally attacking the microphone to just to get what he wanted or running up to the mic to hit certain high notes. He was quite a diva, yes. Don't play across my vocal there, I'm singing. Wait till I stop. <laughs> on the way to meeting Freddie for the first time, the day before, I think it was on a Monday we did the session. <coughs> Excuse me, on the Sunday prior to that, 
I'd had a car crash, a head-on collision with a truck. And I was in some discomfort. I'd broken four ribs and um, also slightly sprained both wrists, which was not really great for a piano player. And um, on the first session, of course, I, d I said to Dave Clark, I, whatever you do, don't mention anything to Freddie. I don't want him to think I'm complaining about anything. And we started to, um, to record this track in my defense. And um, it was just piano, bass, and drums, and, and, and Freddie. And we were getting, you know, more and more intense about this. And, and um, Freddie was going, yeah, this is great. I love all this. Um, you know, harder, faster, do, play some more twiddly bits, get faster, a bit flasher there and whatever. And um, I had got what I thought was the definitive performance, as far as I was concerned anyway. And we went to listen to it back and Freddie said, um, oh, that's wonderful. He said, it's ever so nearly there. I said, my God, you mean ever so nearly there? He said, yeah, well, I think you could do a little bit more at the end, so it's a bit more exciting or whatever. And at that point, um, Dave Clark said, um, well, Fred, you know, he said, he did have a car crash yesterday and he's in some degree of discomfort. And Fred said, oh, we'll find him. He said to <laughs> Phoebe, give him some vodka and give him some pills, make him feel better. We'll go and do it again. It'll be fine. <laughs> so we had to go out and do the whole thing again. Freddie was uh, an absolute non-technical person. I mean, I think at times he was still amazed when uh, he heard w uh, what he actually did came out of the speakers again. I mean, this is making it a bit too easy, but still, uh, technical things he, he wasn't interested in. And uh, I mean, he tried to explain, so, uh, but uh, usually just uh, left it uh, to me or to find a way to, to, to do it. And uh, I think that uh, uh, was for a good working relationship because we never really had to discuss in length or at length how to do it. With Freddie, n there was never a rehearsal in the studio. It was always the, 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 it was always the, the full type of thing. In fact, sometimes he used to make such a racket, it was unusable, you know, knocking things over and whatever. I remember uh, a really late night jam upstairs because the studio's upstairs on the piano and Freddie singing and improvising with so many ideas. It was great. At one point I remember Mike actually stopped playing because he was so tired and Freddie had all the energy and kept going. And uh, there was a sort of a few words spoken like, oh, keep going, keep going, keep going and everything. And we've got that on tape, which is rare because um, normally he didn't like a tape running while he was doing ideas. He, didn't, uh, he thought people shouldn't hear anything until it was finally finished. Possibly the most impatient person to uh, convey a thought onto tape because uh, as soon as this happened in his brain it uh, would be nice if it was actually finished and was in the charts. Freddie was a great one for testing you. In other words, you had to work damn hard when Fred was about and, 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 the, and there was none of this, oh that'll do business, which is, which is not my way anyway. but. Um, you know, the, the two of us were such sort of perfectionists in the studio, it's a wonder we ever got anything done, to be perfectly honest. Um, but it was a great, um, it was a great experience. And um, I remember many times in the studio that, um, you know, for example, Fred would go out and sing after I'd finished my bit. And, um, and I'd be sitting there, would say, well, what do you think of that? And I said, well, it's okay, apart from that. And he would say, <laughs> I remember one occasion, he turned around and said, for God's sake, he said, you're worse than I am. We were a really good match because I could, uh, after a while, sort of pick up what he was thinking. And uh, we were thinking along the same lines pretty much. And uh, I managed on a few things to, be, to become faster than he thought. So um, the, the working relationship was, I mean, and the personal one was uh, extremely good. He could go crazy. He could, he could actually um, ask people to do impossible things or, or things that he could, he could conceive of but maybe could not quite execute. And um, one of his favorite things, you know, he would just say, oh, come on, dear, you can do far better than that. Go faster, louder, crazier, you know, whatever. All these, um, all these ideas, you know, I want you to do it even more than that, or when you play something really well and he said, no, I think you can do it even more. There was this constant, constant quest for, you know, even more extravagant things or even more um, interpretive things or more dynamics or whatever. I mean, when you've got a lot of things on your mind, so to speak, um, you can get lost a bit sometimes. And he was always very good at making things very clear as to how they should be and how other people 
would like to hear it. Freddie never played safe artistically. He was always willing to explore that bit further beyond it. I mean, he would never be dictated to by what people thought, for example, ought to be commercial or that's the right thing, you, know, you can't do this, you can't do that. Fred never played, he's a very courageous man artistically, and I think that's the most significant thing I learned of him. And don't be scared of pushing yourself beyond what you, know, you think you can do and, and what other people expect you to do. Just try anything you like. If you feel it's the right thing to do, then do it. That's how I remember Fred, a courageous artist. Yeah. Oh, definitely a perfectionist, yeah, everything, and every single note had to be examined in min minute detail. And he was very much in control and in charge of every single note as well. I can remember um, with Mike, who's the most fantastic musician, um, him actually all the time over Mike, um, saying, I want it to sound like this, I want you to play more like this. And, um, and it was a difficult job for Mike to do as well, I think. But it was hard work, yes. But it taught me that you never give up. You, you always keep going and you fine tune a thing until it's right. You don't just say, oh, well, that's what we can do and here it is. You don't stop until it's right. We went to all the important functions, Christmas, birthdays, and we became very close on a social level. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. That house at Garden Lodge was an absolute delight to be in, um, full of wonderful things and done with impeccable taste and it was also a home it was a place that wasn't precious either um, fabulous array of friends we had hysterically funny times wonderful sing songs around the piano with you know you name it they were there <laughs> but to, but but sometimes just Fred Peter Strake and myself um, hours on end he really tried to be the perfect host and uh, he, Freddie was really sort of funny in, in trying to lay the table, bring up, uh, bring on drinks, and uh, he really tried his very, very best to be a good housewife. He was an immensely kind, thoughtful, generous, sweet individual. Um, very amusing. He was the most incredibly funny man. And very loyal to his friends. He was incredibly n nervous about, about meeting her in the first instance, but um, Fred had such a wonderful um, presence that, of course, as soon as he met her and got over the original, my God, it's this diva I've loved for many years, he then became very animated and, and, and really wanted to know all the details about her life and these great performances that he had on video and all these, you know, great recorded performances he had of her and um, and you know within 10 or 15 minutes of them being introduced they were you know they were best friends it was an extraordinary lunch and it uh, yeah he was he was in awe of her it's not in awe is, is perhaps the wrong word um, he had an immense respect for her and 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 she was one of his favorite performers so the the actual meeting in, in Barcelona um, took the edge off when we work together, but he's, it's still the first time you, you work with someone like that. Um, and I suppose, conversely, the same goes for her working with him. It's a totally alien thing for her to do. She'd never done it before. And I think one has to remember that this was before um, the three tenors had you know, sort of come forth. It was really before people had gotten the idea of mixing you know, rock stars and, and, and opera, operas, be, opera singers perhaps becoming um, crossover, con, uh, crossover successes in the commercial market. He was going to do some music with an opera diva. I mean, he loved opera music, we all know that. From um, Bohemian Rhapsody, for instance, all those opera influences. And um, he was just beside himself with uh, happiness that, that this was all going to happen. And everything had to be perfect. And there were flowers put in the control room for her arrival. I remember him insisting that the studio there in London redecorate the ladies' bathroom, just in case she might use it. Uh, everything was put in place. Uh, he, he, he always thought of all those details for people to make them comfortable. I remember when we, um, 
when we first did Barcelona and um, before he and Montserrat had really performed together, he, um, he was, this was in Ibiza at the Coup Club and um, Montserrat had arrived and he said to me, well, maybe I shouldn't, you know, you know she's, she's a you know, well-respected diva and she's perhaps not used to my cavorting around you know, the way I do. He said, maybe I should sort of tone it down a little bit. I said, well, it's your, your show, Fred, you do what you like. And um, of course, what he'd forgotten um, was that here was this diva that came on, has done all these powerful operatic roles. Of course, she came on like the battleship Potemkin, you know. And, <laughs> and he ran over to me and, this, and he said, she's outdo me, watch this. Boom, and off he went back again. And that was the start of this chemistry. But he was quite taken aback. I, I just remember him waltzing over the piano. He said, wow, she's outdoing me. I'm, this is not on at all. And this amazing chemistry then, then started to take hold and, and off they went. Um, I remember, obviously, the, the, the Freddie the performer. Freddie the private man, I remember um, on wonderful one-to-ones when he, you know, he confided some very private things, um, which are not to be repeated. And um, he was just a very generous, lovely man. That's all I can say. I think that's it. Well, he was very much in, into creating an image and keeping up an image for the outside world. But uh, at the same time, he wanted a private life and look after his bosses and cats. And uh, that he simply couldn't do in London. And uh, obviously not in New York. There's too many bars there. I think they chose Munich because um, a lot of bands at that time came through Munich, such as uh, Deep Purple, Uriah Heep, um, what else? Uh, T-Rex and uh, so I guess it was something like word of mouth too. Say like a neutral ground which uh, has a different language. He, he was able to go into shops, he could go just in the supermarket and uh, just wander around and do things uh, by himself without uh, having press or just people breathing down his neck. He could go to the beer gardens and just more or less behave like a regular person, which he very much was when he was off stage. And I took him down to the English Garden, um, where they have the big beers, and uh, he just sort of walked in. He had like a fairly outrageous outfit for that time, you know, like uh, Hawaiian shirt, flowery shorts, and uh, a bunch of people, and you know, and I pretty much knew everybody there, so it was like kind of uh, unusual, uh, t uh, but uh, he, he was so uh, charismatic and, uh, you know, just didn't care about anything, so I figured, what should I care, and uh, that made for a good start. He was uh, very much outgoing here, and uh, as I said before, he, he didn't have anything to lose, and he, he just could talk to people in the bar where nobody would really uh, be very much interested in are you a singer and uh, that would be always like second or third stage but first it was just uh, having a good time and dancing and uh, what not. The Barcelona album and, and subsequent things were not the end of the story yes I but I guess we would have carried on with his solo album which was interrupted you know, fortunately I suppose by by this collaboration with with Montserrat yeah we would have carried on we would have carried on, um, you know, on a different tack. Mm. Yes, yeah. There were many things we talked about, which, uh, which, um, which perhaps would have come to fruition. Yeah. The intent wasn't really, at least uh, in the later days, to work all day and all night. Uh, it was more do a little bit of work, do that uh, concentrated and quick, and then go out and have a good time for a long time. <laughs> I remember one thing which, which sort of in, in, a, in some way sums up Fred's, Fred's um, approach to life. Um, we were around there working in the afternoon and also there was an event in the evening which just encompassed, uh, sorry, um, um, encompassed the usual suspects, myself, my wife Linda, um, Peter Straker, um, a few other friends. 
just the same people that have been around maybe two weeks prior to that. And um, I was just leaving to go home and change. And Fred was fussing around, getting everything right, flowers, um, the right um, tableware, everything right. And I said, Fred, you know, you know and, he, and he, made, um, he, made, he made some radical change in the flower arrangement. I can't quite remember exactly what it was. But, but I said, Fred, you know, calm down, relax a bit. It's, it's only us, you know. And he said, my dear, he said, that's, that's absolutely the whole point. In other words, his friends were the most important people in the world, and that's, that's why he made the effort. It's a, it's a great object lesson to anybody. It doesn't, you know, you, ma you make more effort for those people you care about than you do for anybody else. And that was perhaps Freddie in a nutshell, yeah. It did change my life that I actually uh, realized uh, there's not that many really, really good people around and that I had to be really grateful for actually having the opportunities for a number of years uh, to work with him and not uh, to slave away over a hot uh, Mexican console and uh, trying to make people who aren't really all that good into something uh, what the record company thought they should be. Well, as uh, far as I'm concerned, I, th I think for the entire time we've worked together or were together, everything was been, uh, what needed to be said was said. But um, after he was ill, it uh, was just extremely difficult uh, to actually get through to him. I mean, uh, telephone-wise or, I mean, I even went round to his house and uh, he was out to see his mother and uh, I tried there and uh, I probably didn't try hard enough. Mm. I should have tried harder. This is the only thing uh, I'm not really too happy about myself. He was like one of the really brilliant rock and rollers of the time or of all times really. Not many people who can uh, sort of live up to that. There's some days I can be mixing in here on someone else's music, which I, I do these days. And I'll suddenly hear him in the back of my mind saying to me, make that louder, make it more obvious, in the way that he would have said it to me when I was mixing for him. And uh, I find it quite uncanny. It's, he's still there. And I really appreciate that. I think it's great. And I miss him a lot. I've been very fortunate in my life to... to have been involved with some of the, you know, the bigger rock bands, played stadium rock, um, jazz, popular music as a studio musician. Um, I think for my money, Freddie Mercury is perhaps the finest interpreter of a song I've ever worked with. So the, the, I've never seen anybody that gave so much to a performance. It was the most extraordinary person to watch. Extraordinary emotion when you're on stage with him. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an artist who gave absolutely everything in every performance. Never half measures. So I put Fred right up there with the very best of all time. I miss him so much, you know. Amazing, you, you don't realise how much people influence your life until they're not there anymore and you know so it's like rehearsing when Roger called me up said look you know would you like to, to play I said oh, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled to, to do so you know um, and he said well can you play this song this song this song okay so the tapes out and play, which I haven't done since Fred died and you know I, I it, it, was a ter it was a terribly painful experience to, to do that, you know. I, you don't... You know, I've thought about him so much more, I'm ashamed to say, <laughs> since he's died than, than when he was alive. Every day, I think. A great loss, really.